All right, thanks for coming. I know it's uh, lunchtime, and no one likes to miss lunchtime. So uh, my name is Josh Pitts. I uh, got out of the Marines right before 9-11. I uh, wrote uh, Backdoor Factory and uh, Backdoor Factory Proxy. And this is, uh, this is a file infection framework that will inject code into PEELF and MACO binaries on the x86 and 64-bit side, <clears throat> and also do ARMv7 for ELF. I, uh, because of that, I found Onion Duke, which was a uh, Russian uh, malware infecting downloads over Tor. Why would you do that over Tor? I have no idea. Uh, but I, I co-authored an uh, environmental keying framework uh, that made environmental keying malware called Ebola. And yes, that's spelled correctly. I work at Okta where I do red teaming. I, we uh, do design reviews, everything you can think of, pen testing, reverse engineering of anything we put on our network. And uh, there's my Twitter handle, and there's my GitHub, where a lot of this code is. So um, why this talk? Well, you know, I, I think writing shell code is fun, believe it or not. Uh, my wife thinks I need new hobbies, and that's fair. Uh, so, and I want to talk about the current state of public window shell code, how it works, and talk about updating it. So we got three parts. There's history, there's further development, and there's uh, mitigations and bypasses. So the first part. So Metasploit shellcode right now uses Stephen Fewer's hash API or, or Metasploit payload hash. Uh, the, the basic concept is it, uh, of it, uh, it uses a four byte hash with a 13 bit ROAR instruction uh, to find Windows APIs and to use the export table or to find Windows APIs in the export table of a DLL, any system DLL. And it was introduced in August 2009. And some of this has roots back to uh, Matt Miller or Scape's uh, Win32 shellcode paper, and these slides are online, and I have a link to the paper. Uh, and, and Scape now works for Microsoft in the mitigation department. So just keep that in mind. So this is uh, how it works. You do a call over the payload. You push everything onto the stack, and then the 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 uh, the shellcode or the, the hash API will parse the export address table and then jump into the Windows API and it'll return back to payload logic and it will continue until there's no more payload logic and your, your payload's been executed. Now, this allows, what was kind of cool about this is this allowed payloads to be portable across all Windows uh, platforms. And of course, some mitigations uh, decided to uh, be, or to come out. You have Emet or Emet, uh, that this was uh, obviously by Microsoft. And then you have uh, Peter Benia. He has a frack article on, on beating uh, some of these uh, payloads. And then there's also the Havoc um, mitigation, which was released, uh, the concept was released in POC GTFO 12.7, amen. Um, and, and Havoc stands for halting attacks via obstructing configurations. And this was funded by DARPA, uh, Fast Track, and it's by Digital Operatives. And what it did, it threw, um, it threw a DLL up into the loaded module list of uh, the DLLs, and it, what it what it did it it, con it basically it pre-computed collisions uh, for this four byte ROAR um, four byte hash uh, ROAR assembly. Uh, anyway, so what it did it, it made these collisions, and it actually uh, worked pretty well. So there's also the Emac caller in EAF uh, protections. Remember the shellcode was introduced in. August 2009, and the EMAT EAF protection was introduced in 2010. And what this does, it protects uh, kernel 32, NC DLL, and kernel base uh, from being able to read that. And then also you have the, uh, the caller protection, which is really more uh, restricts ROP like calls, but Stephen Fears hash API actually would trigger on this also. Basically, you cannot go into a Windows API via a, a RET or a jump. It had to be basically a uh, indirect call. <clears throat> and as you may have heard, Emet is end of life. It's supported through July 31st uh, next year. It still works, and but it's being reintroduced into Windows 10 uh, this fall, and we're going to talk about that. <clears throat> and it, it does still work. I mean, so this is the this is the protection. This is the Tor exploit uh, that was targeting uh, some people that were doing illegal things on Tor. Nobody does that. Um, <clears throat> and it, it it basically it it flagged on a stack pivot mitigation. So so Emmet still has um, uh, some relevance in the field, right? So bypassing Emmet, <clears throat> there have been a couple uh, uh, public bypasses, and uh, Skyfer had a, a um, or Skyline, used a, a method uh, to make Emmet think that the code was 
valid reading the export table, going to the export table. And then you have Peter uh, Bonilla, and he would, when, when Emmett used hardware breakpoints, he would erase them, essentially. In offensive security, they had a bypass by reusing code within Emmett itself. Now the caller uh, bypass, uh, like I said earlier, if you have the handle to a Windows API, all you do is move it into a, uh, there's a couple ways to do it, but all you do is you move it into a, uh, a register, dereference the register, and then you can call it directly, or you can do an indirect call. I think it's shorter to do an indirect call directly, I think it's only two bytes. So <clears throat> knowing this, I, back in May 2014, I put import address based, based payloads into BDF, and they worked just like compiled code because I realized the closer you, you are to working like compiled code, the, hard, the harder it is to stop you with uh, any mitigations, and it also makes you harder to see for antiviruses. Uh, so I added these uh, in, in, in May, and then December, I wanted to see if I could use a concept in exploitation. Um, and I wanted to use the import address table. So I looked for some prior work. Scapes, uh, paper, again, I used that, I looked at that. There was an uh, import address table payload uh, that he had, but there were some issues with it because he used the export table to get to uh, a, a API, a load library A, and then he would use that to get to a DL, DLL and then use the import table off of that. Um, and it was, uh, I think it was hard coded to a certain version of, of a system DLL. And then, uh, uh, Peter Bania, he had a import address table parser. I decided to use that, but just for reference, the first known, I guess, use of the import address table uh, for something malicious was a virus from 1997. Okay, and it, it was not really an exploit, it just used the import table directly. So uh, <clears throat> it, it was a file infector and it would just use the import table. So this is uh, Peter Bania's uh, point of concept. I could not get this to work on a modern Windows OS. Uh, I think I was testing this on a Windows uh, XP Service Pack 3 and also Windows 7, and so I decided to update it uh, for s some tolerances, and I, I was playing that. So the way it would work is you would find image base in the uh, PEB, you'd get the PE header, and then you'd get the import table relative virtual address, and then you would loop through and find kernel 32 via an ASCII uh, match. And so um, next I would find low library A and get uh, procedure address, but I added a check in set to set bounds of readable memory to make sure that um, it was readable memory because if you couldn't read the memory you would have a crash. And then after this, this stub is done, low library A would be an EBX and get, uh, pro, get procedure address, get proc address would be an ECX. And I bolted on a reverse TCP shell and it's this bypass caller and EF checks really easy. And then I emailed the EMAT team. And uh, this was the response, essentially. <laughs> so, uh, so they knew about it, obviously, uh, Matt Miller, I don't know if he was consulted, but they knew about it. I mean, they get tons of crashes and they analyze those crashes. Uh, so, and my POC just used the load library A and get a uh, proc address from the import table. It was pretty limited, so if the, if the uh, binary did not have it in the import table, then it was useless at the time. So this code sat from December 2014 until February 2016 when Sub-T, if you don't know Sub-T, you should get to know him. Uh, he's the person that executes code and things, he run, executes code and things that shouldn't be executing code, not through exploitation, but through hidden features and other, um, things that just, you know, these are signed by Microsoft and you can run code in it, it's great. Like, you know, like, it's pretty awesome. So uh, he, he, he tweeted that he was having problems at Emmet because of EAF and I knew exactly what his problem was. So uh, we started to collaborate and I sent him the only stuff I had at the time and he went crazy with it. He was using it pretty much everywhere. Uh, the only problem was in PowerShell, uh, PowerShell did not have load library A in the import table. So we talked about uh, moving, looking elsewhere for low library A and get proc address from a loaded module. And so he wrote an addition to do this. And he borrowed code from uh, Stephen Fears hash API stub and changed it around a little bit. He decided to use a four byte hash, uh, the, the ROAR uh, al algorithm, to, to find just the DLL name versus DLL and API. And so that means it would, it would, find, it would use that hash to find um, anything in the loaded module that will match that. And so if you're gonna do something like Havoc, 
where you're going to uh, cause a collision, you would need to know all the possible combinations of anything that might be deployed with any application as far as DLLs. And so, um, so yeah, uh, uh, he wrote that stub and we were excited about it. So we, now we had two stubs. Okay, that's, that's cool, right. Um, so then we knew that you could use get, get proc address anywhere in memory space. And if you do that, you can get, you can get load library A, as long as you can enumerate the location of kernel 32. So we used a four byte hash algorithm, like I mentioned. Uh, and then we would get, um, this is how we would uh, get uh, load library A. Pretty simple, right? And then we'd push the handle onto the stack and then move ESP to, uh, e we'd push the, the handle of load library A onto the stack and move ESP to EBX and then we'd do a, a indirect call to EBX. So now we had four stubs that we could use. But we didn't know where we could use them. So what we did is I went through and enumerated um, system binaries across all fi five operating systems for load library A, get procedure address, or just get, get procedure address in the import table. And this is the output of that. I saved the output in a JSON format. So when you're, you were looking for an import to use, it would walk everything that is loaded recursively in a, in a dependency walker style fashion uh, to find anything statically that might be in memory. So we had a lot of opportunity to abuse this. And um, if you look, you see they made an effort to decrease the use of load library A and get, get proc address. And you see Windows 10 has less right, than, than XP, obviously. Uh, but then you see there's more get proc address. So either way, it was, it was a, a pretty good find. So we were gonna submit uh, uh, to a CFP, or we are gonna submit uh, to a conference. Uh, this is about uh, June, and then this came out. Uh, a flash exploit that used get proc address from user 32 import address table to load a payload was discovered by FireEye. And this was pretty depressing because then what we had, we, we, it, was, it wasn't good anymore. I mean, not good, but it just wasn't as exciting. So we wrote a blog post about it and we released a POC that would pick for you which stub you would use. Uh, and we released a reverse TCP shell with us with no exit function so it would automatically crash all the time. Uh, that was kind of trolling a little bit. But um, we wanted to do more stuff. So we wanted uh, more payloads. We wanted to get this into Metasploit somehow. And we knew it would be a lot of work. And we had a couple ideas. So that brings us to part two. So I had two ideas. Remove Stephen Fewer's hash API and replace it with something else completely. Or build something to rewrite payloads the logic uh, for use with the import address table uh, parsing stuff. So I decided to rewrite all the things. Um, and do it automatically and magically. And this is, this is how Metasploit payloads work. You push everything on the stack, well, for, for, for x86. So you push everything onto the stack, then call the hash API with uh, a call EBP. Um, so I had a workflow. I used capstone for disassembly, keystone for reassembly. The only thing that I had issues with was protecting the save load library A and get proc address from being clobbered because of conditional instructions. Uh, that would pick a path and then I'll lose context. Um, and I worked on this for five days straight for about uh, 12 to 15 hour days over Christmas. Not on Christmas, but over the Christmas holidays. And when I solved one problem, more appeared. And there was a point that I crossed it and where I could probably just rewritten everything, or at least get in a good, or at least have a good POC of things uh, to show for my work. But really, I had nothing. So I decided to burn it down. Uh, so the next idea was to take the hash API and the actual payload logic, remove, remove the, uh, the old hash API, use my, one of my import address table stubs, then offset table. Um, so I had some requirements. I needed to support uh, read execute memory, just in case I wanted to use this other places uh, that weren't uh, read write execute memory. I want to keep it small as possible. I want to support any Metasploit payload that uses uh, Stephen Fuhrer's hash API. So I have the same uh, four steps. I would take, I would take uh, inputs in, disassemble it, capture the instructions, um, uh, or, or capture the blocks of instructions, capture all the APIs. I would build lookup uh, offset table, and then I'd find the appropriate import address tables for the executable, and then there'll be an output table, I mean uh, output to uh, different types. So even if the user does not provide the DLL they're looking for, this would do it automatically because of all the uh, JSON uh, output that I've saved. So this is what I came up with. Uh, so you would take the four 
block, four byte block hash uh, used in the API to parse the export table. But now it's going to point to the APIs and the DLLs that were going to be called. And th those are going to be in a string and they're going to be null terminated. So, for example, that you, you have the first hash, right? It's four bytes. And then the, the DLL offset, if it matches, is going, to, is going to point to kernel 32. And then the next API is going to, the API is going to point to win exec. So you have the next hash, points to kernel 32 again, and then it points to the next API, exit thread, so on, so forth. So you do, because I unique the string, you do have some overlap and you can save some space. So this, this is logic for the parsing, for parsing the lookup table. Basically I jump over the table, I move the first hash into the lookup table and I continue until I find a match. If found, I move the DLL offset into AL, I normalize for memory, and I use load library A to load the DLL. And then I save the DLL handle, I put the API offset in AL, normalize, and use get proc address to get the win API handle. I prepare the call to the Windows API by clearing the stack. I save EAX down the stack for recovery on pop AD. Then I save the return address to EBP. Then I call the Windows API. On the API return, I fix up EBP, EBP to point back to the beginning of the import address table stub, and then I return back into the payload logic. So this is how it works. I jump over uh, everything into the uh, payload logic that comes with Metasploit, uh, and then I return in, or I, I do a call into the import address table stub. And then lookup table goes into a Windows API, returns back into the lookup table, and then I go back into the payload logic, and I just continue until done. So the initial POC to write the lookup table took about 12 hours, and then adding all the workflow and uh, the stubs took about another 12 hours, uh, and, and it took a while to get the tool where it's at, but I'm really happy about it. So now that these um, API hashes are uh, been, they no longer hold reference, um, they're now meaningless. Okay, after, after it goes through and we figure out what they are, they're meaningless. And I found that AVs depend on them for signatures. So what, what, what happens if we um, just randomize them? It's pretty fun, actually. So I got a demo of that. Let me uh, do this properly. Everybody see that? Okay. Okay, so all I'm doing here is just doing a, uh, I'm just outputting to, to file a reverse TCP um, shell from MSF Venom. And then I'm going to cat that out into uh, FIDO. That's what the name of this tool is, FIDO. And I'm going to do a load library A get proc address. Um, I'm going to use those out of the import table of the main module and I'm, I'm uh, outputting that to file, and, it, it, and the output's uh, fairly fairly useful. I'll tell you what's going on. Pretty straightforward. And now I'm going to use backdoor factory and infect TCP view, and I'm going to put that on Windows 10. And there's Windows Defender. Of course, it was detected. I'm going to do the same thing, but I'm going to use M for mangle. I'm going to use backdoor factory again to infect TCP view. I drop that onto disk. And then I set up a netcat handler. and then no detection. All right, so here's an example of using FIDO, just as you saw in the video. <clears throat> so I was having some issues with a couple of DLLs, and when I say couple, all the system ones. Uh, I was running into a problem where, where uh, I had to build a blacklist to avoid using those as saying that they had the uh, get proc address or, or low library A in their import table. And I decided to look at this because it was going to a point where I was just blacklisting everything. 
and I figured out that it was just Windows 7 through 10, so I decided to look, at, look into it even more, and this is when I discovered uh, the effect of MinWin. Uh, these, these DL typically these are used in system DLLs. It's, it's for portability, and they have been used in Windows 7, since they've been in use since Windows 7. And if the DLL, if it is in the DLL's import table in your process space, you can use the exposed APIs, such as uh, get proc address. And in, in get proc address case, it's everywhere. It's in every single process um, because it's in uh, kernel 32. Uh, so this is a view of kernel 32's import table. So kernel 32 is import, importing get proc address via its import table through one of these minwin DLLs. And, it, and then it exports it back out uh, so it can be used you know, through the normal API. But if you're parsing the import table, you can use it. So let me, let me explain what this means. We just need get proc address in any DLL, any import table uh, in any DLL to access the entire Windows API. Or just, we just need it, just need get proc address, period. So uh, since Windows 7, get proc address has been in kernel 32 import table. So that means we've had a, a stable MET, EAF, and caller bypass since Windows 7. And it still works on Windows 10. So I'm going to demonstrate that with uh, the Tor exploit. I talked about earlier. All right, so what I'm showing here is I turned off the stack pivot uh, mitigation just to show that EAF uh, will flag uh, the as, as far as the mitigation. So now I'm going to drop the exploit and payload into um, Tor Browser. You can see the mitigation pops up and tells you what was flagged. It's very nice. So now I'm going to uh, just run FIDO with using Firefox as the uh, target binary. And what you're seeing here, uh, where it says number of lookups to do, it tells you everything. That's recursively it's parsing through and trying to figure out which, what DLLs are loaded through the system. And then it'll continue through and tell you where you can, you can, where you can use what import table. And so um, it automatically used get proc address. You can see it at the bottom where it says GPA. But I'm gonna use the MinWin DLL. Because you can see it's in kernel 32 and it's the API MS Win Core library loader DLL. And what I, what I did here is I had an encoder to uh, put the output uh, stand out uh, to, so I can reformat it into uh, a proper JavaScript format. Just showing that. I already have it in the uh, exploit example. I just need to uncomment it. This is a, a calc payload. Restarting the Tor browser. And there you go. All right, and um, so these payloads were introduced at, at Recon Brussels back in January 2017. Uh, for DEF CON 25, I'm releasing 64-bit payload, payloads. And that brings us to uh, mitigations and bypasses. So I opened up a uh, GitHub issue to incorporate these import address table payloads into Metasploit. Uh, part of what I was offering to do was to release these 64-bit stubs uh, to help with that process. And, and if, if my talk would have ended here, right here, However, three months later, after my GitHub issue submission and five weeks before this talk, the EMET protections are being added back into Windows 10, implemented via the kernel. Additionally, uh, Matt Graber uh, pointed out to me that there's now a import address table mitigation, <laughs> which is, this was my reaction. <laughs> Just flipping tables for days. Uh, yeah. So how does, how does the uh, import address table filter work? Well. 
so I you had to download I had to download the preview edition. This is coming out in the fall, by the way, officially. But you can get it in the preview edition. So first off, they're not enabled by default. You have to go through and click through, enable everything. But what it does is they take there's a pointer to the import uh, name, and they zero that pointer. So at, at this point, uh, the, the thunks are still there, so that compile code can work. But at this point, you're driving blind, and uh, <laughs> if you're driving blind, you're you're probably going to crash at some point. And uh, yeah, it's pretty awesome. So, but you know, the funny thing is, I knew that something like this might happen, so I had a an ace in my pocket. Um, so this is kernel 32 entry for get proc address, and on the next line is get proc address for caller. Um, this was introduced in Windows 8. It's exported by kernel base and then imported by kernel 32. That means it's in every process. It works very similar to get proc address. It's not filtered by the import address table filter yet. Um, and this is how it works. You just add a zero on the end, and that's exactly. <laughs> yeah, way to go, guys. Um, so yeah, so I, so I've added I've added this into uh, Fido, and you use it basically um, use it through extern GPAFC. So I got a demo for that real quick. Um, Sorry. All right. So, what I what I did? Let me just. I don't remember. All right. So what I'm doing here is. So I'm just taking a 64-bit uh, reverse shell from uh, Metasploit, and I'm using just get proc address. And then I'm passing it into backdoor factory, uh, patching who is 64, and then I'm going to throw that onto the operating system. Now I do not have the protection enabled yet, just to show you that the protection does work. There you go. Uh, now I'm going to enable the protection. And then uh, it's going to take a second to crash, but it will crash. There you go. And then I'll run it again, and it should be faster the next time. All right. Now I'm going to use uh, get proc address for caller. Put that on disk. And there you go. So I did let Microsoft know about this. <laughs> so they're going to. They're gonna they're gonna have a patch for it whenever it comes out officially, um, because since they were making an effort to make an honest try to fix it, then I decided to let them know. So now what? Now we can't parse the export table or the import table. Uh, is it possible that you could find more APIs that are not filtered and that could give you some useful information to get to get proc address? Yeah, probably. Or what if we didn't use the import table or the export table? So let's, let's think about this real quick. Um, in modern user space Windows exploitation, you have to bypass ASLR, DEP, and other protections. And on top of that, your exploit is most likely to be tailored to a specific version or versions of software and operating systems. So why shouldn't your payload be targeted also? Why does a payload have to work on every operating system from XP to uh, Windows 10, right? Why not make it targeted to that specific um, version of application. So the way you would do that is you would go to get proc address directly. And the way it would work is you take PEB image base, and that's easy to find, and then get proc, the offset for get proc address, 
And that's going to be version dependent and the offset can be found during exploit or during exploit or payload development. And um, this can be in the main module of the main program or it can be any, in any application uh, specific DLL. So I would not target system DLLs because those change very often. So if, so if there's a DLL that has the same offset for a number of versions, for, for let's say they depend on OpenSSL for something and they just, they just, uh, they don't update the open, open SSL binary, binary, even though you're not exploiting open SSL, you can use the uh, get proc address um, offset in that DLL across multiple versions. So, and, and it does save code. So this is, this is the import uh, parsing table code to find get proc address, just to get get proc address. It's a, it's a fair bit of code, um, but if you know it, if you know what get proc address offset is going in, that's how much code it takes, obviously, right? So, uh, and, and so what if, what if you had um, more, what if you had, uh, you couldn't find a single get proc address in one uh, DLL? Well, what you would do is you would find a um, DLL that was consistent acro across all versions that had a uh, get proc address, and then you would engineer, you would diff the binaries, uh, across the different versions, diff the DLLs across different versions, and then you would make a similar lookup table uh, so that you could use the diff sections to figure out what version you're in and that would be associated with the appropriate offset table. So I have an example of, n not of the actual diffing process, but I have the example of using an offset for get proc address either within the main module of uh, a program or the external offset or, uh, of a DLL, right? So um, if anyone wants to help me develop that or engineer that system, please uh, find me. I'm easy to contact. I'm on Twitter and I have an email address. Uh, but that sums up my talk. Any questions?